Good evening, dear artist and guest. On behalf of Billa Academy of Art and Culture, I welcome you all. Today we have a panel discussion titled Institutional Intervention in Contemporary Culture. Our panelists don't need any special introduction as they are known to all and well known in their respective fields. However, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sri Chhatrapati Dotto, Principal of Government Art College. Eminent artist and professor Adib Dotto, art historian and professor Shomik Nandi Mujumdar, and artist and professor Sohini Dhaw. I also welcome Johnny Emil, art historian and curator, to moderate this session. Now I would formally request Johnny Emil to conduct the session and please come over the stage. Thank you. Respected panelists, Sohini Dhar, Chhatrapati Dhatta, Swamit Nadi Majumdar, Adi Dhatta, dear friends, today we have an interesting session called the Institutional Interventions in Culture. <clears throat> there is something ironic also, because we are sitting in an institution and we are talking about interventions. Generally, we understand institutions as certain kind of a censoring body, you know, that doesn't really allow us to express things. But there are institutions at the same time, they allow us immensely to proliferate our ideas and things like that. Whenever we talk about institutions, I come from this Althusserian idea of ideological state apparatuses. Most of the institutions have this tendency to be ideological state apparatuses, like family, police, hospital, school, religion. All these things are ideological state apparatus. State uses all these particular entities to institutionalize our culture, our life, and anything related to it. So basically, an institution does classification and ordering of things. So institution, any institution, including family, that comes into place or that comes to act as an ordering agency that classifies and order. So institutions are always not really helping us to proliferate our culture or our ideas, but they help us to live in a society with a certain amount of order. They classify us. They tell us what exactly we need to be. So in the case of culture, institutional intervention is a problematic term. Now coming to culture, what exactly is the meaning of culture? The word culture comes from a root word, Latin word called cultura, cultura. So this word was actually used for rearing up anything. To bring up anything. It didn't have the, the, the meaning that we talk about culture today or we identify as culture today. And by 16th century, it got the parlance as bringing up or rearing up animals, that means cattle, and agriculture, farming. So basically, culture was something that has that had something to do with agriculture, farming, and animal breeding. It didn't have anything to do with the human, you know, connotation or human agency or human life. The word culture got this human implication by 18th century, 
the post industrial society started having this idea of culture culture means that the human development human progress and by 19th century we come to know that culture as we understand today culture is a conglomeration or a combination of ideas which have something to come which has something to do with our mind our mental development a set of rules and principles that help us to grow in a particular society so this is these are the two things that actually bring the human life human life possible in our society then there is uh, something something very interesting thing happened today is that uh, uh, most of the cultural formations in our life start with schooling or from family but families are not ideologically free today our cultural outlook is actually formed within these families and when we go to school there also we are taught in a certain way to behave generally we speak that colleges especially schools and colleges are ideologically free entities they are neutral agencies neutral interfaces where students could actually could be taught schools are the places where students learn and teachers taught that is the way we ideally understand a place called a school but in fact the schools are not ideologically free the teachers come with sort of baggage and also students come with a sort of baggage historical and cultural baggage so it is the, the teaching is not one sided it is actually an interaction there is always a fight between the ideology of the teacher and the ideology of the students who actually gain their culture from the families so there is a sense of order there is a forceful ordering of senses or principles within the school so culturing in culturing of students or in culturing of minds is a totally different issue or a totally different thing which we call enculturation of minds so these are institution that make our mind culturally inclined but those cultures or that cultural te teaching need not be necessarily taking us to certain progressive life or something like that you just imagine a school where we call the school as a neutral space where the teacher asks the student what is your caste or what your father is doing which area you are living in a city what is your family tradition or a family business so through all these things somebody's identity is understood so how can we call school as a place which is ideologically neutral so all the institutions in that matter all the institutions have certain kind of interventions in our mind and now i would say today all the cultural institutions or institutions in general enforce some kind of a censorship in our mind we behave because we are institutionalized we behave in a certain way in a certain fashion fearing that our behavior our words or deeds could create some problem for us so we start self censoring ourselves so in this context in this background against this backdrop how we are going to see institutions even if they are national gallery of modern art lalit kala academy or any other art college any other fine arts uh, museum or gallery anything any institution even the philip certification board you know like a sensor sensor board any institution how they are intervening in the cultural makeup of our country or our cultural makeup of our minds so this is the general backdrop that i i would like to actually present as the uh, as the, the preamble for this 
panel discussion and uh, our, 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 our format is going to be something like this. Each speaker would take five to six minutes to present the case and two of the uh, panelists like Mr. Chhatrapati Dutta and Mr. Amit Nandi Majumdar, both of them have got a, a small illustration. That means like, it is going to be a visually illustrated lecture. So that may take a bit more time, like maybe 10 minutes each. So once the, all these cases are presented, then we will have a kind of open discussion. That is the format of this, uh, this panel discussion. And uh, with the eminent panel's permission, I would request uh, Sohini Dhar to come and uh, uh, you know, present your, your, your case. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Shikadi, and all the members of Bill Academy who has invited me to, you know, present my views on today's talk. And it's a very interesting subject, as we just came to know from Johnny. Uh, as institutions, as we are all aware of that, and he just talked about it, that institutions in various forms plays a major role in each and every body, in each and every life of ours. I would like to start with the school itself because I believe in the theory of catch them young because that is when a child, as a child, starts to, you know, develop the very basics of human understanding. So keeping that in mind and being a practicing painter, I always feel that at present, what we understand by culture and tradition, which obviously is a very organic growth, it has its own growth. It is never static. It is never, you know, uh, though we say tradition is something age old, but still it has its own growth. But what I always feel, and presently living in a city, like Kolkata, we are perhaps exposed to too much of visual images, which is creating a lot of confusion. And ultimately, it is becoming more of an, you know, uh, what to say, an aesthetic curfew, perhaps, lacking the very understanding of uh, a kind of artistic expression. A simple example can be given that though we have such beautiful art galleries all around the country and especially in this city, but it is mostly the known faces. Every time we encounter the known faces who all come to see and appreciate the work of art. But from the school days, very presently, even the drawing classes have been eliminated and, you know, as we all are aware of, that is the work education classes which are on. Now, from the school days, unless and until a child is given the appropriate, you know, uh, space as well as the appropriate kind of understanding of art, Art does not only mean that it has to be a, a painting or a sculpture, but anything that they can create on their own. I feel this imbalance in the society will keep on going and there won't be any solution to it. So I feel that to get this, we need to incorporate a kind of uh, policy that way because institutions are policy makers also at the same time whether it be an art college or a school or any institution so we need to make certain kinds of policies which will help the child to imagine and imagination only can lead the particular person to nurture their originality further in their life. They might not be an artist, they might not be a painter or a sculptor, but as an engineer, as a doctor, 
that imagination is so very necessary, but that is what is lacking in today's schools. And further, that, can, that gets reflected when we don't find any of the common people in general to visit the museums or the you know, interesting exhibitions. I think I just started and I, I can leave my other panelists to speak on it. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I don't have any illustrations right now and I have my panelists who will be showing them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sohini. Uh, now I would request Adib. Yeah, why I'm saying that? Because followed by two visual presentations. So it will be uh, kind of, you know, it will remain in the minds of the audience and then, then we can come for the discussion. Please. Uh, thank you, Johnny, uh, for inviting me to reflect on the subject. And thank you, Brilla Academy of Art and Culture. Uh, it is definitely a privilege to be a part of this panel discussion. Uh, to start with, I shall take two different, uh, maybe at times, uh, you know, contradictory positions. One, that of an institution, because I'm part of an institution. I teach at an institution. I shall also be, uh, you know, uh, 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 sort of reflecting on things as an individual, as an individual practitioner and especially as, uh, you know, an artist. <clears throat> uh, you know, to sort of to, to be brief, what I understand that there are two kinds of spaces. One that is real, quote unquote real, and the other that is manufactured. And both would have elements of, you know, of an institution. What I mean by a real space is, you know, a, a space that would connect to, you know, the socio-cultural, the socio-historical, the socio-economic uh, situations of the site that it is located at. I'll, I'll sort of I'll come up with examples. And then there are spaces which are, um, again, <laughs> quote unquote, elitist spaces. The first space that I'm talking of um, is a space that I sort of belong to because uh, the university, uh, uh, you know, uh, is where we get to see students. They come from diverse uh, sort of backgrounds and um, and, you know, they are related to these sort of very uh, uh, specific, real uh, situations. They are human agents that we deal with. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you how it sort of, you know, how organically uh, the institution works. Uh, at times, you, you, when you sort of say, uh, when you by chance, when you meet, um, say, the parents or someone from the family of the students that uh, who've spent, say, five to seven years at the institution, you, uh, you know, it, it, at times it is, it is a moment in itself because that is when you start uh, thinking that what that, you know, particular student has uh, passed through, what has his journey been, because, you know, his entire body language, his mind, his sensibility is changed in course of that uh, five or seven years. And when you meet uh, someone from the family, you understand from where he sort of started. So, what I understand that the institution, not conscious, though not consciously, but in an organic fashion, um, operates uh, uh, silently um, and sort of transforms an individual. That is what is the best part, the productive part of an institution. So, again, sort of, to, you know, to come to the productive part of it, there are institutions uh, which are accommodating uh, and at the same time, which are productive. There are institutions which are accommodating but not productive. I'll give you another example. I, uh, you know, again, sort of in a, not, in, not in any derogatory sense, but there, in our city, there, there are spaces, public spaces, 
which used to be of a lot of significance, say, say in the 60s. Say for instance the Academy of uh, Fine Arts, which is, um, which is a very important, significant public space, where, which is not, uh, again, you know, so to speak, an elitist space, which does not have a target audience. But, uh, you know, uh, decide it for yourself what happens when you get to see an exhibition, say, in um, a commercial gallery. And what happens when there is an exhibition at the Academy of Fine Arts? There's a wonderful footfall and um, the audiences who are not directly related to art. So, you know, the, the possibility of uh, a cultural seepage is, is, is the most at an institution like the Academy of Fine Arts. But again, unfortunately, over a period of uh, time, that significance has been sort of reduced. There are reasons, of course. They are very strong. So what, you know, sort of to, to, to be on track, what I understand that, that an institution, or, or, you know, if I come down from an institution to a space, a space uh, could just not be accommodating, it, it, it also has to be productive. Uh, to me, the university, uh, the educational institution is one such space. Because, because again, it sort of deals with, with the real situations. I talk of spaces which are elitist and which, uh, which are not, uh, you know, so accommodating. For instance, I know, you know, of a neighboring country from where students and artists, they come. So we know of the situation of that country. We know of the situation uh, you know, of, of, of the artistic uh, orientations, etc. Now, uh, uh, strangely enough, um, you get to see these art summits. You know, I'm, uh, um, I, beg, you know I beg your pardon for, for saying so. I'm part of, of those uh, art fairs, those summits, those whatever, whatever, and I will be. And it's sort of, you know, that adds a credibility to my practice in certain contexts. But yet, when I detach myself and I look at these sort of spaces which have become institutions, it's sort of, it's very interesting in the sense, um, you know, these art summits, these uh, art fairs, these uh, whatever, like, you know, art Basel, Freeze, and all, they all look alike. Uh, and the situation is sort of, you know, it's very international, of course. It's sort of a wonderful exposure. You get to see these curators, museum directors, they're coming, they're taking part. But surprisingly enough, um, uh, participation, local participation, you know, of that uh, country uh, is very sort of, you, you, is, is almost negligible. But that's, that's sad and that's also sort of quite funny at times because you know of a country, you know of a city in a certain way and then suddenly when you see these uh, sort of, uh, 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 you know, whatever, art summits and all that, it's a completely different uh, space altogether. So, so what I'm basically trying to, uh, uh, you know, say is that an institution, it's again an ideal uh, situation, an institution uh, should try uh, to strike, or I shouldn't say should try, but you know, would be in a sort of a, um, a, a productive situation if it strike a balance between, or it knows to strike a balance between the real and the productive. I know that these, you know, the, the, the term real, the term productive would uh, require uh, sort of clarifications, but I think as the discussion goes, we can, uh, you know, take it up and we'll sort of discuss it. Or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adil. And uh, uh, so, can you talk about the policy making to to in order to uh, start the art education from schools itself? And uh, Adil actually really very realistically put two situations, like the real and the elitist situation. I think the audience must be lapping up the latter part because the art expos have become more or less elitist, you know, like exclusive and insular. So that, that you wonderfully put. 
Now uh, we have, uh, I would uh, request uh, Shaubik to start the visual presentation. No, um, I would like to thank, first of all, Johnny and Villa Academy and all of you in the audience for making this evening and this uh, panel discussion happen in a very meaningful way it has begun. And I would also like to thank all the panelists for being with us today. Now, as a uh, take-off from what uh, uh, Shohinidhi presented in the beginning, I would like to say that, uh, yeah, we do need uh, a more liberal approach and policy also towards uh, at the very basic level of art education, particularly at the primary school level. But at the same time, talking about interventions, we uh, do see that how children at various stages, willingly or unwillingly, knowingly or unknowingly, they also kind of make some counter interventions through their artworks, through their uh, creative um, engagements, but here I do agree with uh, Shohinidhi that but we need to provide that opportunity. We need to provide certain basic kind of spaces in order to ensure that children do uh, make some counter uh, interventions. Otherwise it doesn't happen and many of us, uh, um, I know uh, not everybody is fortunate to have studied in such schools. There are schools in India today, plenty of them, where in the name of art education, uh, what is actually done in the classrooms, we all know about. Uh, if we know that it's a, it's, it is still in a very pathetic situation. Now, uh, just as a uh, preamble, brief preamble to my presentation, I would like to say that uh, what I would like to make you run through today, through these slides, uh, it's a kind of a, uh, I have quite a few slides, um, uh, so I'm sorry that we won't have enough time to look at each and every slide very carefully. I will run through the images just to give an idea that there is at the next level, that is at the college level, there is always this possibility that instead of entirely depending on, always instead of entirely depending on the uh, course structure and the curriculum, and uh, depending on the institutional approach, again, it is possible that uh, to, to create spaces and as uh, uh, Adip uh, rightly said, in fact, we need to manufacture spaces where students can once again intervene back and uh, create further opportunities, further spaces uh, to go beyond uh, what um, Johnny calls uh, or has uh, kind of mentioned briefly or tried to kind of refer to as a kind of censorship that keeps censorship not always in a very categorical manner but there are all these unwritten ways of uh, telling the students this is something that is expected from you, this is something that is not expected from you, things of this kind. Now in this context, Kala Bhavan the institution where many of us here have studied and I'm teaching over there. Now, Kalabhavan is a very curious case because Kalabhavan, I'm not going into the history as such today because we don't have really time, but, uh, sorry. Uh, but Kalabhavan is one such uh, historically extremely important and very significant institution where the very origin of Kalabhavan is rooted in a kind of historical intervention and we all know that history so I'm, I'm not going into that history but what I'm trying to say that right from its uh, beginning from its inception uh, the teachers in the Kalabhavan, uh, the masters in the Kalabhavan, the students in the Kalabhavan, they try to create various kinds of uh, possible interventions uh, within the given space within the physical space also and also uh, to manufacture, once again to use Adip's uh, uh, term, uh, to create uh, also public spaces in terms of mural activities, in terms of outdoor sculptures, and also in terms of experimentations, 
in terms of bridging the gap between what is called art and what is called craft, in terms of uh, addressing this binary uh, very severely to the extent that Nandalal even in those days, very early days, had to fight um, against certain people to convince them that we need to incorporate something like book binding as a part of our curriculum. I mean, this is also, this should also be identified as a very interesting, uh, or uh, one such example um, of uh, very serious interventions happening, uh, not necessarily in a very theoretical manner, but in a very practical way. Now, you see, uh, in this photograph we see that uh, even in Kalabhavan, uh, at least in some of the classes, particularly in this photograph, we see Ram Kinkar is uh, conducting a class on uh, model study and then he or some other teacher, I don't know, in the next photograph we see Ram Kinkar's own sculpture becomes a model. But, I mean, this has never happened before. Because what we know uh, from the history of uh, the art colleges established by the um, colonial government, for example, government art school and all, the only model, uh, sculptural model that you were supposed to study was the Greco-Roman models, the Western realistic models. Not such an example of a very modernist sculpture where that becomes a model to study. Anyway, now this is where uh, things become very interesting that not only through art and design and mural and auto sculpture, even using architecture as a form of intervention, something like this, very fam famously known as the Black House, a uh, very unique hostel with a lot of relic sculpture. And interestingly, on the walls of the Black House, the, in the relief sculptures, you find images. Um, none of which is actually a creative image in that sense that uh, none of them is an image which was created by or imagined by the artist because all these images were sourced from art history. So um, the entire building was wrapped up with art historical images. This is also a very interesting intervention uh, into the whole notion of uh, the creation by artist because we are always looking at or we are demanding something that is original, something that is unique, something that we have never seen before and uh, all these people here, Ram Kinkar mainly and his students, even Nandalal took part briefly in this project, they rather source their images from history instead of creating new images. Now we will have very quickly, after a few slides, another image where we will see uh, this very black house is being intervened once again in a workshop which happened very recently, just a couple of years back. Now, so even space where our teaching would take place inside the classroom, outside the classroom, all these things were happening uh, in a very, very, um, in a very spontaneous way, I would say. Uh, in the Kalabhavan history and um, particularly getting some murals done on the various walls of the buildings on the uh, Kalabhavan campus uh, assumed a form of uh, a movement to the extent that one author called it the mural movement in Shantiniketan. Now, having said this, I would also like to say that um, intervention, is, as far as the history of Kalamukun is concerned, is not just a matter of a moment, not just a matter of a, uh, of a historical moment. It eventually became a matter of a process. I mean, it became an ongoing process to the extent that one on the top left you see one of the oldest buildings in Kalamukun designed by the famous architect uh, Shuren Kaur and this is how it was considered, this is how it was until in the middle picture you see just on the occasion of Nandan Mela some 7-8 years back and um, one of the, our teachers and a group of students thought that let us, uh, let us copy 
and in an enlarged way, some images from Shahoj part, illustrated by Nandalal, on this building also as a tribute to Nandalal Bosch, because it is in this building where Nandalal Bosch had his studio. And finally, few years back, the same building got a tiled mural work done by uh, K.G. Subramanian and intervention came to a kind of full circle because you can't intervene into this building anymore. So it's very interesting that for me it is a very symbolic uh, kind of uh, story, uh, symbolic narrative because on the one hand we do see that to a certain point, I mean, if you look at the history of Kalabhavan chronologically, up to a certain point, this intervention was a process. It got ingrained into the life of Kalabhavan artists, students and teachers. But then uh, it came to a halt where interventions uh, almost uh, turned into a kind of baggage which we term as heritage. And this is where I think uh, I would like to refer you back to Johnny's preamble, the way he wonderfully presented the case. That then, it, once it becomes a baggage and it tends to become stagnant, then it's very difficult then to expect the institution again regain its drive to intervene. And then we tend to say that a place like Kalahun has become stagnant, it has become a dead place, a moribund place, and it can't create any intervention anymore. And I do not subscribe to this view, because this view tends to consider only what the institution as institution, as organization, as a kind of, uh, well, uh, like uh, an ideological state apparatus, as you had called, uh, is supposed to do. I would rather like to now look at how the students are responding to this. Are they simply following this uh, stagnant position or they are also trying to create certain interventions and this is where the case becomes again very interesting. So I move away from the heritage and look at the contemporary activities coming up from the students, how students are responding. Now, just before I go on, move on to the next few slides, let me say that uh, two things have been identified in this history of Kalabhavan so far. One, there are uh, artworks which are permanent and at the same time, there, the notion of something that is not permanent, something that is ephemeral was also very much uh, a part of that practice. For example, you can't believe that this is a practice wall where murals are done every year by a group of students and very next year the entire mural is removed. And nobody complains. Everybody is happy with that. It is because, because we know that permanence and impermanence, something that is there forever and something that is ephemeral, the coexistence of these two aspects uh, make uh, our engagements more meaningful in various ways. So, on the, I'm not going into the details of these images, but uh, as it is well known and as it is also the case with most of the art colleges across the country, that now students have learned and they also feel free to engage themselves with various kinds of materials beyond what is taught in the classroom. So this material liberation has created an enormous opportunity for the students to explore into various ideas and concepts as well. Now, why Kalabun is a curious case and as I just mentioned that what started off as an intervention uh, not only within the art world, but also in the contemporary culture of those days. Um, it uh, certainly became a kind of cultural baggage. Then there are certain practices which are still being carried on. For example, the Alpuna. 
the Alpuna practice in Kalabhavan done on various occasions and many of them are repetitive. Only on certain occasions we do find some uh, reinvention, some reimaginations and reinterpretations. But then when a student tries to do uh, an Alpuna, a kind of note drawing on the Kalabhavan campus and it is not a traditional Alpuna that he is trying to do. Unfortunately, I don't have any image of the finished work. But what he finally did, he did very brief kind of diagram, circular diagram on this platform known as Chatal in Kalabhavan campus. And then he performed right standing on the Alpuna. And he performed a small little piece, not very pre-scripted, pretty, pretty spontaneous on the idea of cross-gender. So he's taking this opportunity I and mean, this practice of Alpuna flow drawing or this flow graphics to a very interesting level and nobody had asked him to do. For example, the next uh, slide you see the same, same chatal, that same platform once, one fine morning we see is entirely covered with uh, a very shiny synthetic, blue colored synthetic material. And when the, that group of students were asked, uh, what exactly was your reader? He, they just uh, told that we, 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 we want to capture the sky on this dry chatal. That's what they said. Again, this is not a part of their daily work. This is not part of their curriculum. They come up with these things uh, without any kind of free information. And these are like surprises that keep happening in the campus. Again, on the same chatal, you see how one given space gets reinterpreted. Somebody, a student, creates a maze and he begins to walk on it and he does a performance right on that space. I'm not going into the details of these programs. I'm just trying to give you an idea that how the space gets reinterpreted and reimagined, mainly from the students' uh, participations and this is a part of uh, a project of which uh, Chhatrada was also a part, he was also a resource person over there. And, there and the entire project was around Black House, reinterpreting the heritage and creating different sorts of interventions. Yes, almost and coming to an end. Quickly we run through a few slides. Just to give an idea, an, an heritage can be reinterpreted instead of leaving it at a stagnant moment. And since Chhatrada was part of this project, he could actually explain where uh, there were also performances on the ground plan of this. Then Nandan Mela is another occasion where Students go gaga over free kind of creations, but mostly in a decorative manner. But yet, uh, these are like spaces, opportunities, or moments where you can intervene the space, reinterpret the uh, space, even decorate the space at a very basic level and transform the space, maybe for two days. Huh? Similar things right now. Uh, are happening uh, in view of uh, Aban Bharati. People have already geared up for that. So various kinds of uh, things keep happening to the extent that one student, he got so fed up after working seven days and nights, he just left his materials on the Kalamun campus and identified that as his installation. Huh. Like this. Like this. I'm not going into the details of this or I'm not going to describe these things. But uh, just last three words I would like to say and wind up my presentation. One of the buildings, in, interesting, it was a heritage building. This is the building where Shomnath Kaur had stayed for a long time, then Shushinda had stayed. Now it became, uh, I mean, it, it was in a pathetic, uh, it was almost uh, kind of uh, ruined and dilapidated. So the authority thought that let us demolish the building and create a new building in place of that. And when a student who was working in that studio came to know, he started doing some graphic images rapidly, just before it was demolished. And knew, knowing very well that, that these paintings are not going to be there even for more than a day. Then there was this student who started doing some drawings on 
a pile of bricks and the bricks uh, and he did uh, not very casually he did quite carefully uh, and knowing very well that the bricks would be taken away one by one and his drawings are going to disappear simply vanish now one of the last projects did, uh, uh, done by a uh, student last year was this, that when he came to know that the clustering is going to be removed from this graphics building, he started painting it. And uh, the masons came and they removed the plasters and with those pieces he created an image of Buddha right in at the middle of the campus. And when even this Buddha began to look emaciated because those pieces started coming off, then he kind of gathered those pieces on that same chakal again. And just by placing this uh, notice, uh, don't touch, uh, kind of uh, makes a mockery of this whole notion of what is art. And this is where I would like to, uh, I'm sorry that I had to end it very quickly. But again, we will have uh, time to discuss and expand on the issues I just briefly mentioned. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, uh. So, we, thank you very much. It was really a wonderful, enlightening, uh, you know, illustrated lecture.